Hey, this is Jeff from the Humans Connecting team. Our podcast is all about serving, supporting, challenging, and inspiring you to become a connected human. The content of our podcast is of a general nature, and consuming this content is not the same as seeking individual advice from a connection mentor, registered mental health professional, or coach. Conversations about human connection address loneliness. We destigmatize loneliness here at Humans Connecting. We do that by talking about loneliness openly. Loneliness conversations include a range of topics, which at times may be difficult for us to talk about, to hear, or to sit with. If throughout our conversation this is true for you, we encourage you to please contact a mental health hotline. The link in the episode description can help you find some immediate support from many places you may be in the world. Our advice to you is this. Meet yourself where you are and how you are right now. If you don't feel up to it, I'll be right here when you're ready. We're glad you're here. Hello, it's Phil. Welcome to the Humans Connecting Podcast. Thank you for choosing to spend part of your day with us on this special episode of the Humans Connecting Podcast, because this is a doozy. This is an absolute excellent episode that you've joined us for, because we're going to get real about workplace wellness with our guest, Joel Anderson. Joel is the founder of Formind a service that has the ambitious goal of shaking up the workplace well-being industry and breaking down the stigma associated with seeking mental health support. Joel will introduce himself shortly, but like me and how I came to create Humans Connecting, Joel is similarly driven by a desire to create change based on his own lived experience with poor mental health. When his mental health deteriorated, it took him a long time to find the courage to seek help, only to find out or to end up with a counsellor that he couldn't relate with at all. You can find all the ways that you can connect with Joel and Formind in the episode description. But before we get into that conversation with Joel, I want to introduce myself and say hi and another thank you for joining us for this episode. Whether or not you're a frequent listener or you're new to our podcast. I'm Phil McAuliffe, and I'm the founder of Humans Connecting, and I'm a global loneliness thought leader. I'm a speaker on loneliness and human connection. I'm a media commentator, an author, a connection mentor, and a human who is just endlessly curious about the human condition and humans full stop. I use my skills, my wisdom, my insights learned from my own experiences of loneliness throughout my life to start and lead important and real conversations about loneliness, connection, and belonging to help humans, humans just like you, to feel more connected and less lonely. I'm also the host of this podcast and the Humans Connecting team and I want this space, this podcast, to be your place where you can come and be supported, be challenged and be inspired when you want to start getting the connection that you need and are worthy of in your life. Because as fellow humans, we both know that loneliness feels horrible And we're learning more and more about just how loneliness damages us physically, mentally, emotionally, and socially. And while we're learning more and more about how loneliness is terrible for us, we already know for all of this sort of terribleness, we already know that human connection cures human loneliness. But if you have been like me and you've gone to take steps to get the connection that you need and deserve because you've listened to your loneliness, 
you'll know that connection can feel really tough to do, can't it? So we are here to help you and all of that, all of that help, support, that challenging, that inspiring, that, um, that, that, that supporting all starts at our website, humansconnecting.org. And on our website, you'll find all of those products and services for you, for households and workplaces and everyone in the world uh, to start feeling more connected. And finally, we are a new podcast and Humans Connecting is a startup social impact enterprise with bold ambitions to help the world feel more connected because the humans in it are more connected to themselves, to those most important to them and to their communities. And if this episode or any of our other content makes you think, supports you or inspires you, please know that sharing this episode with just one other person or leaving a five-star review are both great and, incidentally, free ways for you to say thank you to us for providing this content and supporting you. And they are great ways to support other people in your networks, in your friendship groups, in your family, who you feel might benefit from our wisdom, insights, and perspectives as well. However you choose to support us, please know that we are so grateful. Now, before we jump into the chat with Joel, I invite you to pay attention throughout our conversation to how frustrations, Joel's frustrations with the way that mental health support services uh, are provided or had been traditionally provided in our workplaces led him to be where he is now. Those frustrations and the curiosity that he had as kind of a, um, uh, in response to those frustrations have led him to this place now. And it is a really powerful example of what happens when we pay attention to our response to something and get curious about where that comes from. So while that frustration might feel very real, if we get curious about it, we can actually sort of find something within us that can lead us to feeling really like connected and connected within ourselves, connected to purpose and help us be us in the world with some impact. Right. Are you ready to get real about well-being in our workplaces? Me too. Let's go and have this chat with Joel. Joel Anderson, welcome to the Humans Connecting podcast. Bill, thanks so much for having me on. It's exciting to be able to chat. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, we were just speaking offline and, and viewer, listener, you've been around the block a few times on this podcast, I'm sure. And you'll know that I often say this, that we often have the best chats before we press record. And Joel, this is we've we've been chatting for a little bit now um, for for a few weeks, and I think that well, at least I'll speak for myself here. But I generally end our chats like on such a with such a buzz, um, and uh, like with with such kind of um, yeah, being recharged. Um, so. I was going to say something about like word quotas and hopefully that, you know, you've still got some words left, but I know that you've got words left uh, and uh, as I do, um, but no pressure, but this needs to be one of those conversations that leaves you, me and the audience uh, feeling very buzzed and refreshed and energized and, you know, wanting to make an impact. So with challenge, all that said. Challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. And we'll have to try and keep it under four or five hours as we're both very good at uh, <laughs> talking. So we'll do our best. I think that's a lofty aim. Let's do it. Uh, <laughs> like, let's let's try and rein this in to under four hours. Um, Perfect. So, <laughs> Joel, I'm really keen to hear, like, how did you, how did you come? to be, how did you arrive at this point? 
of being the founder of Formind? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. Um, and I was actually talking with my partner about this a couple of weeks ago, how you kind of look back at your CV or your resume and occasionally you just have a bit of a glimpse of like, how the hell did I end up here? Um, you know, like a CEO of a mental health business. Um, for those of us listening, I was actually originally uh, in construction and then I went and did an engineering degree and I sort of spent the first five years of my career as a mechanical electrical engineer. Um, and then somehow now at the helm of, um, you know, Formine, which I founded out of my own mental health challenges and experience. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, but it actually doesn't make any sense. And if I go back in time and tell 16 year old me that this is where I would be today, talking with people like you on podcasts about mental health, um, you know, having two military parents and we never talked about mental health. That was never a thing um, to now being someone who actually can express that. And probably the other part of it is tell 16 year old me that I would actually talk about my feelings openly on, you know, YouTube um, that's definitely something that 16 year old me would laugh at. Um, so it is quite interesting to see how you end up where you end up. You could probably resonate with that as well, Phil. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm really, I'm, I'm curious here, Joel, like what would be the right pedigree uh, and the right kind of experience and qualifications that, you know, if you were to do this right in inverted commas, like, uh, you know, what, like what would be the right way to land you here as opposed to like this way. following the curiosity? Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. I think that's actually quite an interesting question and it has now being a startup founder, if I could have gone and done this all again and I had, you know, a psychology degree or something like that, I don't actually think we would have created anything useful because I would have been following some very specific rules, some frameworks some things. Whereas what we've really done is gone, there was a situation that happened and things weren't good enough. And instead of kind of following rules and frameworks, we've just gone, let's just do it and see what happens. And sort of everyone who's been involved from the beginning has been so passionate about changing the landscape based off their own lived experience with mental health that we don't really mind experimenting and trialing and pushing boundaries and all of those kinds of things because that's what got us here in the first place was an industry that didn't adapt and change the way that it provided mental health support services in the workplace for 10 to 15 years yeah. um, and that was just something that really pissed me off um, and a lot of other people that there was just this acceptance of a very basic offering and that was normal and so that was kind of the genesis of got, what has got us here today. Yeah, um, I love that. I love that. And and I, you need to give me a warning uh, before you drop kind of uh, that those kind of awesome truth bombs, uh, insight bombs, um, and, and stuff. I was drinking coffee. I thought like, okay, great. I've asked the question. I'm going to have a sip of coffee. And then you said something like, basically, if I'd done it right, we wouldn't be here. We would have been creating something useless. Mm. Um, and yeah, that that sort of I, I needed to keep myself tidy, um, uh, <laughs> like make sure that I swallowed the the, the coffee because uh, that was going to be a a um, a, a messy moment. But you're <laughs> right, you're right, you're so right. And doing things the right way, doing things according to I guess you know for want of a better term, established protocols. And um, doing the right way, doing the doing, uh, how do I say this? Um, doing the right thing in the right way to affect the right outcome at the right time generally produces an outcome. Mm. But whether it is the right outcome or the one that's needed um, is is really um, is, is really something. I'm really curious. Let's you know if it, if you can like let's take a step back mm -hmm. so you've you've created for mind you're disrupting the mental health um support like workplace support services um uh, and you know based on lived experience and using 
the insights from lived experience to kind of come at something really important in a different way. Viewer, listener, is this ringing any bells with you too? <laughs> like, it's kind of like us here at Humans Connecting. But I just want to say, like, I, I'm curious if we could take a step back mm -hmm. um, to, you know, you realising, you having that realisation that what was support like what support was offered support was promoted offered and available that you know it really wasn't fit for purpose for yeah you. so i guess yeah we can go back to probably for me it started at about 16 and i will kind of say as i'm describing these things like i'm not a mental health professional i'm not a psychologist i'm not a counselor this is just my thoughts and opinions based on my mental health journey so you know if you're listening to this um take that with uh, a pinch of salt but i guess essentially my mental health journey and i can only understand this now after going through therapy myself finally later in life um so we'll kind of unpack this as 16 both my parents end up doing stints in the middle east with the military um so oldest child parents both go they come back obviously a very different dynamic around the house. We sort of go through Department of Veteran Affairs. I go once, I never go back. I start soothing with drugs and alcohol at 16. Um, didn't know it at the time, but that was obviously my coping mechanism for being able to handle what was going on. Um, and it got to the point where I nearly didn't finish year 12 um, because I was essentially already what you would call off the rails by the time I was in year 12. And I went into construction because I didn't know what I was going to do and sort of spent a year um, digging a hole in New Acton on a big commercial site and just living the dream. Being a 17-year-old, getting paid like 600 bucks a week at the time was yeah. as good as life gets. Um, went into engineering after that, got my first job, was starting to work quite progressively in this company and climb quite quickly. Um, and it was at this point really that any of our listeners can remember back to when we were sort of 18 to 24, you're living in a share house, you're going to social events on the weekend, like life's pretty good. You've got FOMO. So I'm just afraid of missing out on anything at any time. And then you've got this really interesting pressure cooker situation where you've got your first job and you don't want to let anyone down. You really enjoy the people that you're working with. You love the mission of the company. And so you get swept up in this moment where you just work as hard as you can. Um, but then you don't want to miss out on anything outside of that on the weekends. So you might be drinking and all of this kind of stuff and going on trips and just never resting. And really essentially what it got to, to me was this point where I was a husk. Like I was a husk that was walking around and I could still perform at work Um I was still going to all the social things and I was doing everything society told me I should be doing, but there was nothing going on inside. It was just emptiness. Um, and it got to this point where, yeah, essentially I burnt myself out so hard that I, and I was also really afraid of accepting this. And this is something that looking back now, I, now I know what I know now. I'm like, why did I think this? But for about six months, I wanted to call that EAP hotline number at work. And for six months, I didn't. I called it like three or four times and hung up when the receptionist answered because I was like petrified of having to come to terms with my own thoughts and feelings. Even And I didn't even know who was going to be on the other side. Was I going to be speaking to a counsellor straight away? Was it someone who was going to ask me what the problem was and I just was going to melt down? Mm. Um, so instead of calling it, I just didn't. Um, and the spiral kind of precipitated to this point where I hit rock bottom um, and essentially a life-saving phone call at 1am is the reason that I'm still here today. Um, so that was kind of that real journey. And, you know, it had nothing to do with that particular workplace. It had nothing to do with anything. It was really this lack of awareness for me as a 24, 25 year old man about mental health in general, like about how to actually be alone with my own thoughts. And that was something that I think I only figured out how to do about a year ago. Um, but that crisis number to call when you're in a point of crisis, calling that and then not being able to get an appointment for another four weeks, that was like a four weeks of hell Yeah, because you're in purgatory. You just like, I don't even know if I want to wait that long. I don't know if I actually want to go anymore. 
And then I went and within about five minutes, I knew that this wasn't going to be right for me. It wasn't the right person. wasn't the right time. And I just, yeah, just didn't continue. Um, and so that was really the genesis about what Four Mind is all about. We're on a mission towards zero suicide by trying to prevent the point of crisis from happening in the first place. It's not, here's a 1-800 number to call when you're having a crisis. It's like, here's a platform with a bunch of resources and tools to help you guide and become aware of, you know, different situations. And then combining that with talking to people about how the right time to seek help is after your first fight with your partner, not after 10 fights. Or when you start going from two beers on a Friday after work to two beers after work every day. It's like, these are the things that actually give some I guess, insight into something at your foundational core level is not going right. And your way of coping with it is these other, I'm not going to say unhealthy because I'm not an expert, these other mechanisms for soothing that pain could be online shopping, could be drinking. In mine, it was drugs and alcohol was the way that I soothed. And I was very good at doing that and then going to work the next day and no one ever knowing a thing. Mm. Um, and so that's really what, all mind is all about is shifting the needle to being like, Hey, go have a chat. You might've found out, you know, your mum's sick or, you know, your grandma's in the hospital or whatever. Like that's an okay time to actually go and have this initial counseling conversation. Cause what counseling is, is basically hand holding you through a challenging situation to build a strategy so that the next time it happens, you can actually handle that situation yourself. And then whenever the landscape changes and you have another stressful situation, that's a great time to go. And if you've got a counselor or a psychologist you see regularly, it's like, cool, thanks. That really worked for situation X. Now I've got situation Y and I'm not quite sure how to manage this myself. One chat, maybe two chats. You've got the strategies in place again and away you go. Mm. Rather than coming in in the state of crisis like I was in where eventually it took me about 12 to 14 sessions to get myself out of that hole because I'd waited until the end of my stress journey rather than the beginning. So many things in there to unpack, but I, before I do any of that, thank you. Thank you. And if you're anything like me when you're on, on podcasts or speaking, uh, you know, in, in, in the media or anywhere in public and someone's like, ask that question. Um, like, so how did you get to be here? And you have to kind of go, all right, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm telling it again and I'm trying to offer a fresh new take um, on this. Uh, and I just want you to know, Joel, that I understand that sometimes, some days, that's actually easy to do. Mm. And then other days, if you're like me, most days, that's not actually easy to do. Yeah. Today you got me on an easy day. <laughs> oh, good. Good. <laughs> good. Okay. Um, but yeah, there's there's those days where you're just like, oh, okay. And um the I, I just want to acknowledge straight up the courage that sharing your story takes on the easy days and the tough days. Yeah, same to you as well. I remember the first time we spoke and you kind of told me your story. I don't know if that was an easy day or a hard day, but um, it is important to say. And, you know, up until two years ago, I never told anyone my story because I yeah. was ashamed. Um, and then it was actually through another Canberra initiative running for resilience, Matt Brain, the founder of that said something to me that kind of resonated. And it's all about as saving one life as many times as possible and listening to that. And then you're like, if I tell my story and get over my shame or fear or whatever it is of saying what's happened, if one person listening to this goes, oh, that sounds like something that's happening to me. And then they go and take that first positive step on their mental health journey. Then that makes telling my story really rewarding rather than something to be afraid of. But that obviously takes a long time, like five, six years to get to that courage point. But more people like yourself who are spreading awareness about these things and helping spread stories is so important about changing the mental health landscape in Australia. So thank you to you as well. No, uh, and, and, 
I want to say it's a pleasure. Uh, it is. It's it's in in many ways it's a pleasure. Uh, and I, I wonder if this will land with you. It is a pleasure. It's an honor. It's a privilege. Um, sometimes I actually wish I don't know. Like you know, I'm gay. So I I like it would be so much easier if I had a whole lot of content that you know a podcast that talked about like sexy shirtless firemen holding puppies like that would be that would be so much easier like <laughs> and and I dare say there'd be you know like a larger audience uh, of people wanting to <laughs> contribute and and like call in and all that kind of stuff like who doesn't want to talk about like you know sexy humans um yeah. you know in, in in whatever capacity uh and 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 however you know uh however we identify but um yeah however that doesn't that's not my calling that's not you know why why i'm here uh that's not why the team is here uh at humans connecting like they're here because they believe in the vision uh mm. and um you know some days yeah it is easy and and i just want to say when when we talk about lived experience when we use lived experience and this is a this is something joel that i um it's a term that i'm uneasy with and using yeah. lived experience um because when it comes to like sharing a lived experience of loneliness mm -hmm. right and and you know almost verbatim say for some context like your story could be applied to li my life movie montage uh as well and one of the things you know when i'm doing speaking events or or something is just like and here's the person who has lived experience let's welcome yeah. phil everybody and 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 i'm i'm, I'm quick yeah i'm quick to call that out because it's like yeah, saying you like he's someone special who has a lived experience. He's a real life lonely person. No, no, no. Like when it comes to loneliness, it's like going, here's someone who gets hungry. Here's someone who experiences thirst. And let's listen to that. No, no, no. We all get lonely. We're meant to experience loneliness. Um, we're meant to experience hunger. We're meant to experience thirst because it tells us that we're missing something that's really important to us. And so I actually, like, there's a really deliberate way that why we call this humans connecting, it's because, like, every single human needs connection. Mm. It just happens to be that lived experience, lived experience, actually being curious about my thoughts and feelings and in a similar way to you going, you know what? The support offered is really terrible, mm. and I know I I now know why it's really terrible. Um, is like you know following that that curiosity in that similar way to to to, to bring to bring me here to this point too. But um, I would say that um, this is a lived experience that. thing. It yeah, really yeah. it grates with me. Like I'm a I, human who's following this. I completely agree with you. And it's coming back to that original topic we were talking about, about how I ended up here is if you're out there and you're thinking of starting a business, having, having been someone who's done it now is like, if you don't care so deeply about the problem space, it's going to be really hard to get through the hard stuff. Like, you know, last year I was working in hospitality again, which is something I never thought I would go back to doing to just make enough money to get by am i going to be mm. doing that if i only care about doing this for the money no if i'm going toe to toe in a final pitch with one of our competitors am i probably going to give the best pitch of my life because this means everything to me for reasons other than money yes um, and that actually shows through the way you talk your expressions on your face like how you actually talk to the people on the other side is like that's what lived experience is to me is about how you actually demonstrate how you care through what you're doing it's yeah not to your, not getting you know wheeled out to be like all right phil come and talk to everyone about this you're the you know five minute slot which is great is um and that's something we'll talk about later when we talk about well-being at work one of my pet peeves is very related to that story that you told me so i think yeah lived experience is the thing that keeps you going and doing 
what you're doing when everything gets so tough that you feel like you could give up. It's just like that drive that you can't replicate or like incentivize with anything else. So it's, it's very powerful if used in the right way. Yeah. 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 And yes, I, 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 I like, I'm not religious, but like, amen. That is um, one, one, one thing there is it helps to tap into the passion. Mm. And it's interesting, Joel, um, uh, back in season one, uh, and I think it was like episode four of season one, but uh, we had a global loneliness researcher, uh, like of global prominence, uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, Professor uh, Joe Badcock. And I asked the question to her, like, how did she get to be like a global loneliness expert, like research expert? And basically following the curiosity um, and a whole lot of the guests have said that they followed the curiosity and it wasn't convenient. It wasn't comfortable. It wasn't what they were expected to do, what they should do, but they have each followed their curiosity. And so listener, viewer, like in, and, and it goes like to what, Jeremy Goldberg said in his episode about listening to your heart whisper and our, our minds tell us what we should be doing. They, they roar at us. They, they scream at us um, and, and tell us that, you know, what will people think? How would, how, you know, I'm not ready to do this because I don't have a degree in psychology. I'm not a doctor. I'm not this. I'm not that. And it's like, no, no, no. The heart will find a way. Uh, like, mm. you know, the, the heart's whispering, this isn't good enough. The situation is not good enough. And I'm smart enough to enlist others to support me in this with the skills and expertise that I don't have. Um, because oftentimes when we see a need, we're like, oh, well, I'm not going to do it because I'm not ready yet. I don't have the degree from the prestigious university. I don't have the 30 years of experience or whatever, because even Professor uh, Joe Badcock said in, in, in her response was she was actively dissuaded um, to follow that kind of curiosity that the, the intellectual and academic curiosity matching the personal curiosity about how and the injustice that of, of loneliness kind of just being a default state for the people that she was working with and studying. Um, and, and thank God that she did, because we now know a whole lot more about loneliness uh, and, and, you know, from, from, from great data that, that she and colleagues have, have done through, um, through their careers. Anyway, I just want to like how powerful it is, how powerful it is to follow the curiosity and how inconvenient it is <laughs> like because because it often has us deviating from our life's plan and makes things just look a bit weird on our cvs and linkedin profiles yeah and bank accounts <laughs> yes yes <laughs> like yeah. i thought we just stayed in the in like engineering world or tech tech world and like by now it's like oh everything would be so much easier but when you kind of think back on it every now and then and tends to be thinking about it more when times get half, you're like, I still wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Like it's just kind of the way, the way that it works. Um, yeah. To, yeah. Joel, I want to ask uh, a, a question here and I'm going to ask it after this break. It doesn't matter what business you're in. At the heart of every workplace, there's a simple yet powerful need for people to feel connected, to feel seen and heard, to feel appreciated and valued. This is Pete from the Humans Connecting team. And I wanted to share with you a little bit about a program that we provide called the Creating Connected Workplaces. Now look, there's plenty of generic one size fits all courses and videos out there on the market. You know, and perhaps you've got your work fitness program or the Friday team lunches or after work drinks. And all of these things are fine for connection. 
But look, as a business, as a team, as a human, you deserve more than just fine. We're here to go way beyond that and help create workplaces where every person feels a deep sense of belonging, where every voice matters, and where the strength of our human connections help fuel the collective success. Just like every human is unique and different, every business is different as well. So this program is tailored and curated specifically for the needs of your organisation. But look, don't just take our word for it. Have a look at our website over here at humansconnecting.org and see how we've helped businesses from Specsavers to Medibank. Now, if this sounds like the type of workplace that you'd like to have, reach out to Phil and the team here at Humans Connecting and let's help create a connected community where everyone can thrive in your workplace because you're worthy of that. Jolene, moving the conversation on beyond just, you know, your your awesomeness uh, and, and bravery and, and, and courage, let's just say, like, let's just accept that as, as absolute evidence that you're awesome. I want to ask about like four mind and and what you're doing in um what you and the the four mind team are doing uh, in terms of workplace wellness um and i'm curious what well, what are you doing uh and then secondly what what is what is sort of the workplace wellness sector doing well yeah um, so yeah, it's a really good question. And I guess what we're doing, I guess, is based on, you know, the experience from quite some time ago. And so really what we're trying to do is reinvent EAP. Um, you know, that's the the core focus. And, you know, traditionally many of EAP, those... just for those who aren't, aren't familiar with EAP. Yeah. Employee assistance program. So essentially these are the things that are in your office. They might be coffee table coasters with a phone number or on the back of the toilet or whatever it is. And this is the thing that you should call when you're having a hard time. So one of the things that these have always been these things that if you go and talk to your boss or your HR manager or whatever, back in the day, it was like, I don't want to deal with this conversation. You should call this number. And that's kind of how it used to be. Um <laughs> One of our core focuses is around making everyone in the organization aware of what this service is from day one so that you're not just finding about it in the event of an emergency or something like that. So that's kind of really our focus is driving awareness, making sure everyone knows about it, but more importantly, when to use it. And that comes back to what we were talking about before about the right time to seek out um, positive mental health support, I guess, is early. So that's the first thing. Something I think that the sector has done a lot better is transition away from this thing that's hidden, you know, on the shelf to actually something that is talked about more inside of an organization. So that, that would be mental health in general. So something that we do well is awareness of mental health, awareness of these platforms and actually promoting them internally to our staff. That's something that we have done a lot better. The other thing that has started to happen is through training and all of these different things, leaders actually now are more receptive to having that conversation. If you go in and talk to your boss and say, hey, I'm having a hard time, compared to 10 years ago, that's more likely now to be like, let's go grab a cup of coffee, not go call this phone number. I'm palming off my responsibility onwards. So there is that layer, I guess, of empathy, of connection, to being like, I really care about you as my underling or whatever, you know, the hierarchy is. Yeah. Let's go and have a chat about this and how can I help you? So that's something that is being done really well. Um, and I don't know what your opinion on this topic is, you know, like having been in the space and I know you travel all around the world and like all of that kind of stuff for work. Yeah. What would be some of the things you thought was done well? Yeah, I, I I agree with you. I think the the level of awareness um, was like improved uh, mm -hmm. over like I so I was in the Australian Public Service for twenty three years, um, and yeah, that that kind of level of of awareness and um, human empathy, uh, which. I find it ironic that 
it's now a highlight. Like, oh, you know, we're, we're responding empathically or uh, empathetically. I'm never quite sure how to describe that. Um, uh, so I'll just say empathically. But, um, you know, I'm like, yay me. Like, or, you know, this is, this is the way that we do it. So I, I find it very interesting that we needed to remind humans that it is okay to respond to other humans in a human way. Yeah. Um, and for me, like, while, while there was that, like, yay, this is an improvement, absolutely an improvement, can we just pause for a moment and reflect on, like, the nature of that progress? Um, so, Joel, you were saying, and, and I've certainly experienced this um, training that I received as, uh, as a supervisor, as a leader in, um, in my employing agency was very much, if someone's having trouble, like just slip, like have a conversation with them, but kind of write down EAP's number on mm. a post-it, slide it across there, and everyone just gets on with their days. Um, like duty of care, tick, um, and, you know, that's now on to them. Now, you know, as you've just said, like we're, like it is being done better, but it's just to that point of like respond as a human. Yeah. I think this is actually, you know, reflecting on my story. And I said it in the beginning is like my story and lived experience had nothing to do with that particular organization. It had all to do with the fact that I didn't know enough about mental health and my own emotions to realize that my boss at the time was capable of having a bad day just as I was. I saw this perception of everyone else appeared to be fine. But in reality, every single other person at that time, 24-year-old man, everyone else appears to be fine. That's what I see. That must be what it is. Yeah. And so I never had the courage to even speak up about this in that particular situation. But if I had, I actually know, and I still speak with a lot of the people that I used to work with back then. I know if I said something, I would have got amazing support and I would have got that cup of coffee and I would have got that. But it was just all about my perception of what everyone else was going to think and now that I'm older and you kind of have your own people that you're mentoring and people underneath you and I'm managing people is like my big thing is if you're not having a good day I would like to know straight away and we can do something about it because I've said that from the outset and that's only because I've been there and you know all those years ago even though it was 100% the case that I could have talked to HR or my boss or whatever it was and I know I would have been loved and supported I didn't because I just didn't think that humans would care about me because I was trapped in this mental health maelstrom or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. yeah. And I think yeah. that's, the shift. that's the real big shift is that the more you can kind of get across to other people that other people have bad days too. If you go and speak to someone who you've been working with for three or four years, more often than not, you're going to get love. <laughs> and yes. if I can go back in time and do this all again, I would have just said something earlier and I know I would be in a completely different situation than what I'm in now. So yeah. that really comes back to my main gripe about mental health literacy in schools and in universities and teaching these things earlier rather than a bunch of the more useless skills I learned back then. Like, you know, it would have been great to learn, learn about mental health and learn about tax returns. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I know now, but I think, that mental health literacy is so much better now. Um, and a lot of that can be said in, you know, in part due to social media and other things where people are just talking about this so openly that now everyone's aware of it. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's quite, quite interesting to reflect on that. So we've talked about what, what, you know, is being done better and what, what things are, um, doing well. And I, I just, before moving on to the next half of that question, I, I just want to underline there, like um, that point that you said there, Joel, about like when we're all up in our own heads or we're kind of, you know, consumed with our own um, turmoil. You mm -hmm. said maelstrom, you know, and, and you know, in a similar way. And like, when we're, you know, like I, when we're in the middle of a shame storm, um, yeah. You know, it is really hard to have capacity 
uh, for anything else beyond the thing that is is consuming you in that in that moment. Um, and being able to kind of say, um, you know, I'm 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 not actually going okay right now. Um, sounds like at times I'm broken now and forever um yeah. and and stuff but uh I, I i fully agree with you in terms of wow saying it to someone almost certainly gets met with a oh like that's really shit um mm -hmm. you know how can i how can i like you know make it a little easier for you to be in this storm in this turmoil weathering this maelstrom um and you know like you know I, I i think that's that's absolutely awesome because we can actually truly believe that nothing's going to be there and not, nothing and nobody is going to be there for us and it's the power of the stories that kind of particularly when we're in a, a loneliness experience i'm talking about here those stories can be extremely seductive and saying no one will get it no one gets it like you can't even um, speak about it yourself. Like you don't even know what words to use. So like, just shut up, carry on. Yeah. But in all of this, it all for, for what is improving, how does the mental, uh, sorry, the, the, the wellness at like the workplace wellness sector, like what, what needs improving? Yeah. So I think, one of the big things across the board is, and so, you know, like I love things like Are You OK Day and these days they're really great at raising awareness and all of those things. I think for a lot of people, there is a little bit of a frustration around it being the one day a year that people care. Um, and so this is kind of one of the things that does need improvement is, you know, in and I've been always been quite lucky to work in organisations that people do care all the time, but just what you hear out and about is that sometimes organizations only care on one particular day when they can get the cupcakes out there, they can get the photo, they can post it on LinkedIn. That's all great. Look how great everything is. And they mm. might not actually have any other policies or anything to do with mental health or well-being. Um, and so I think that is starting to come across now as something that employees aren't dumb. <laughs> you know, like that can be seen through, um, you know, so easily and i think it's something that needs to shift from being we only care about well-being on one particular day to we care about it all the time and we're really lucky that we get to work with amazing companies that do care about this all the time that's why they might have partnered with us as another method for providing support on top of you know whatever other framework they've got um but you know doing the one-off yoga thing once a year or like parties once a year or you know doing the quarterly team barbecue or whatever it is and then never ever doing anything else to show people that you do care about their well-being is really something that needs to improve and that can be simple as i remember one of the first ceos i ever worked for he had 300 staff but he would say good morning to every single person when he saw them and like that was the difference between being like okay who are you? And like, I'll follow you into battle, <laughs> Mike. And it was so simple as just like an acknowledgement and just a little bit of like remembering what you said the previous time and then being like, oh, you know, how's so-and-so going? Or, you know, like, you know, what happened with that thing? And it was so simple, but it was really like one of the most effective ways at showing that there was some level of caring. And then obviously that resulted in a very open door policy where you felt like you could go and say things back the other way. Um, and so that's something that I think, yeah, some organizations do really well, um, some don't. And I think the other thing is, yeah, managers often, yeah, seeing this as a bad thing when someone comes to them and talks to them about a struggle that they might be having. And you really have to think about it the other way if you're listening to this and you're a manager is, would you rather have an employee running at, say, 50% productivity for four weeks because that's how long it took them to come and talk to you about this thing? Or would you rather have them come to you, you give them two days off to get their ducks in a row, and then they're back and refreshed or whatever it is after three days and then back to normal. And so it's like shifting this mindset of like, you know, you've got your spreadsheet or your productivity metrics or whatever is like support early, really care, 
and people will get back to their best selves faster, which means that they're going to be able to do their job better and you're going to have the flow on effects of all of this. Um, mm. And that's something that we are seeing a little bit of a change. It's something that needs to change a bit, a bit faster. Um, but it's the most important thing, right? If you've got that open, we call it psychologically safe work environments, essentially. It's like, I feel safe to be able to talk to my colleague or my boss or whatever it is about whatever I'm going to. And I know I'm not going to get judged. And I know I'm going to get some kind of support in terms of not a card to call that has its role, but like someone actually caring and saying, how can we help? Um, mm. Which is the next step, I guess. feel here like i'm just reminded of something that is like law not law but l-o-r-e um around here at humans connecting and um what you're speaking about there joel is the power of belonging mm. and humans thrive when they feel that they belong. When we feel that we belong in spaces, in um, situations uh, where we will thrive. Yeah. And we know, we know this like within ourselves because when we don't feel that we belong, um, we feel pretty awful. And it's unsustainable. Mm. It's an environment that we don't want to be in. And the key to belonging is really simple. Like the equation is very simple. Like it's not some fancy algebraic equation. It's, it's an addition. And it's when humans feel seen. Mm. Plus when humans feel heard equals belonging. We will feel that we belong. And so it's simple. It's so simple. Simple to say. Yeah, on paper. <laughs> it's simple to say. Like the answer is easy. <laughs> like saying the, but what, what that requires then is, and this goes to what you just spoke about, like would you rather as a leader, as a manager, someone coming to you, like in the middle of a, a of a pretty stressful afternoon and going, oh, feeling a bit overwhelmed. You might be as a leader and, and, and a manager feeling a bit overwhelmed as well because you're trying to steer, you know, steer the ship in the crisis. Yeah. So you might be having your own kind of, you know, inner turmoil as well, and you're trying to keep your shit together. But how powerful it is, and I'm sure each and every one of us, Joel and viewer, listener, like each and every one of us are probably, you know, uh, eyes looking up somewhere towards the ceiling right now and going, oh, yeah, I remember that time. How powerful it is, like, you know, when things get tough at work, how powerful it is just to sort of go, yep, like I'm I'm struggling a bit. And, you know, uh, and knowing, as you said there, Joel, that things are going to be okay, even if you're struggling, like you, yeah. you will get back to, you will get back to stuff. But also the admittance of things not, not going swimmingly is actually a powerful moment for connection. Yeah, there's a really important um, quote that someone told me a while ago when it comes to workplaces and wellness and I guess, you know, loneliness kind of comes into it or belonging and it's all in there is, you know, as employees, and I've been guilty of this myself, we're always seeking praise from top down. And I was like, when was the last time that you gave praise to your manager and said, I actually understand how much pressure you must be under right now and i just want to say thank you for shielding us or for being there and doing that when do you think the last time they ever heard that was mm. and mm. it's sort of really changed the way that i think about things because you know when you get further and further up the corporate ladder you get lonelier and lonelier 
until That's, when you're at the yes. top, the top is the loneliest place in the world. Um, and so it is quite nice when you do have those people underneath who come back and do every now and then it's like, you don't have to thrive on getting positive recognition from people under you. But when you do, someone says, good job. Yeah. I'm like, whoa, like that's turned my day from a two to a 10. Um, yeah. And so I think that is something that is really important and often forgotten is like, if you do want to seek the praise from top down, then important part of it is also setting that framework yourself by giving it up. Um, yeah. That I think is, yeah. Something that's pretty important to remember, even if you are having a really hard day, because a lot of the time the managers are dealing with a lot of stuff that we don't see. And some managers are a lot better at hiding or showing or whatever it is that than others. Um, mm. I've been lucky. I've always had amazing bosses that when I've been really struggling, I'm like, hey, I know you're really busy. I just need two minutes of your time. And I would always get that two minutes, even if they were super, super busy. So I acknowledge I've been quite lucky in that regard to always have amazing managers and, and mm. but it is tough when it's not like that and you can't get that support so it's kind yeah. of just important to reflect sometimes on you know before we go off the rails or you know kick and scream and whatever is like just take a second to pause try and put yourself in their particular shoes on a day that might be just one of their bad days like we were talking at the beginning I can tell my stories on Sundays and not others just because my dog ran away at the park in the morning or, you know, I spilled my coffee all over myself when someone told a funny joke, who knows? Um, and I think that is the really important thing to consider is that everyone has bad days, including ourselves. And I feel like as we get older, we get better at realizing that and then wanting to tell our younger selves that we should have realized it sooner and it would have made our lives easier. Um, yeah. I think that's kind of the key thing that you develop as you get older is that ability to sense when someone else might be in a position that you were in yesterday. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm reminded here of um, something that characterised my workplaces uh, and I see all too commonly, and that's scarcity. Mm. Of? <laughs> Time, money, people. So, uh, but an abundance of expectations. Yeah. And if we just pause for a moment and think about it, like I, I, I you know, had a, a career in the public sector. In the public sector, the money doesn't come from profits. The money comes from government, uh, like allocating funds. And so ridiculously, ridiculously, I had to operate uh, two overseas offices uh, like across two countries, with an operating budget that was slashed by 90% from one financial year to the other. Uh, and by the time I found out about it, that, you know, operating budgets had been slashed, um, I'd already overspent. <laughs> like, and... Um, like it, it just sort of got to like to the point of ridiculousness. It got to the point of ridiculousness, and and you're just like, well, you know, this is an imaginary budget. So like, but but anyway, without getting into into all those those kind of details. But one of the things here, like, when there is never enough, there's never enough time, there's never enough money, there's never enough people to do the work. But there's such an abundance of expectation from others and, and in government, when you work in the public sector, that expectation comes from um, the public. It comes from politicians. Uh, it comes from other countries. Uh, it comes from everywhere, but also it comes from within the organization. It comes mm. from critically, like my situation at least, and, and very commonly uh, in the environments where I worked within ourselves. And, um, but one of the things is like when, when, when we're sort of in an environment which is ruled by scarcity, but also the heightened expectations that we put on ourselves and that are put on others, because, you know, in, in certain areas of the public sector, if you don't do it well, it's discussed on Sunday morning political talk shows. Uh, it's talked about between heads of state during conversations like 
Um, it's talked about, um, you know, on the floor of parliament. It's talked about in all these kind of places. And there's such this, this pressure, this pressure in that, that kind of just getting through. And then in the private sector, um, operating efficiently is all about that balance between um, work and people to do it. Too little work with too many people, that's inefficient. Um, too much work with not enough people is inefficient, but just a bit more work than the people to deliver it, that's great. As far as balance, oh my goodness. <laughs> it is. It is. And like when you're working in the public sector, like, you know, I worked in immigration. Like, if you don't want to deal with us, I'm sorry, you can't come to Australia. <laughs> like, like wanted to make it as, as nice and as 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 a great as experience as, as possible for those, you know, uh, for, for for people. But like, like you can't go anywhere else. Like we had the monopoly. Mm. But when, yeah, like, and so in either sector, in either sector, so many of our workplaces are, are ruled by um, that that kind of the thoughts and feelings of scarcity, like, and it's never enough. And so we can do these great efforts, like these 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 Herculean efforts, like a bomb goes off and fellow citizens are... Uh, you know, uh, 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 having a terrible day, they've been uh, affected by, you know, a, a, a terrorist attack or they've been robbed or or whatever. And, you know, it happens like someone's in a crisis and you have to respond to that crisis day after day after day. That's your job. Mm. With never enough money, never enough time, never enough resources, but that those expectations. And, yeah, one of the things is it's like I, 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 I if... Or when workplaces in whatever sector are dominated by that scarcity. And then the humans within that don't feel that they belong, that they're never good enough, that despite their best efforts, it's never enough. And the reward for doing great work is more work. Mm. Um, then it just seems to me to be an absolute recipe for disconnection and loneliness in the workplace, particularly loneliness, but, you know, and, and broadening it to, um, well, loneliness being a social health issue as opposed to a mental health issue. But then on top of that, left unchecked, we know that loneliness sort of morphs into, not sort of morphs into, left, left untended. Loneliness leads to all sorts of adverse um, outcomes, mental, emotional, physical health, outcomes yeah i think that's like a quite a nice i know we've got a, a final topic before we try to wrap it up in under four hours but yeah. that that really that last thing about how you kind of manage that yourself and you know mm. lonely, i would say like loneliness has many faces yeah uh, so you know i'm an extrovert and i've been working at home for the past year and that is struggling that is a struggle for me um but, you know, it might be when you're in that workplace situation and you feel lonely because you can't connect with the people you're working or your best, your favorite colleague leaves or you move cities. That's kind of hard. And that's sort of how I got to Sydney was, you know, Canberra boy forever talked about leaving to Sydney forever and never did. And then when I finally did, it was in lockdown and you kind of uproot your whole social situation. And then you go into a leaky, awful red fern terrace that's covered in mold. And you work from home for six months in a city where you don't know many people. It's like, that's a lot to try and manage yourself. And everyone has these kinds of situations. That was my face of loneliness, I guess. But for others, it might just be, yeah, you know, you don't speak with your best friend anymore or whatever it is. Um, yeah. Or you put too much effort into too many different friends and then you find that you're not connecting with any of them anymore. Yeah. Um, and, you know, my dad, one of the smartest things he's ever told me is, Son, when you get to my age, you'll be able to count your best or closest friends on one hand, choose them well. <laughs> and you're like, whoa. Like, you know, so you spend a lot of time being like, oh, okay, and social media has driven this in us, right? To have as many friends as possible and all of this kind of stuff. 
Whereas I've like completely cut back on my social media use. I maybe go on 10, 15 minutes a day now. I've got an app that just makes them all black and white on my phone. So I'm not drawn by the colors of them. Like, and since I started doing that, I've noticed my mental health has improved significantly. Yeah. yeah. That ingrained nature of like have a thousand friends on Facebook or whatever it is, that is a very toxic, dangerous thing to associate with being connected because you're often not um and so that's kind of i guess you know tips and tricks of like you know keeping well in those difficult times is often and ironically is disconnecting you're like how is that going to help me connect it's like well you're disconnecting from this false kind of thing that a bunch of you know really rich successful companies have got you addicted to and you're actually stepping back being in the present being in your community, going to the dog park and meeting new friends at the dog park, which I'm lucky enough to be able to do because I have a dog. Um, and actually talking with those people in those random situations, to your point, it's not like you go to the dog park and have a conversation with someone and you're immediately friends. It might take six months. You might only know the person at the dog park as, you know, Donut's mum. You don't even know the person's name. You don't know the dog's name. And so over six months, you kind of listen for cues and then you realize their name and then you get on first name basis and then you go for a drink. And that might take you a year. It's not going to happen straight away. Like on social media, I'm a friend with you now, Phil. Thanks for accepting we're friends. Boom, that was easy. And so I yeah. think is one of the most important things when we kind of talk about, you know, staying well while we're at work is staying well outside of work. And I think one of the biggest challenges we're going to see moving forward in the future as these younger generations come through too is everyone disconnecting from their bloody phones for like a large chunk of the time and just yeah. like get used to being alone with your own thoughts because to your point at the beginning of the podcast, that's the challenge now. And that was the challenge I experienced is being alone with my own thoughts. How do I get better at doing that? We used to do it for months. Some people in living in rural Australia would not see people for months and months at a time. And that's just what was normal. So that wasn't necessarily a feeling of loneliness. Maybe loneliness in that state was eight months without seeing someone. Whereas now it's like six seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Without, uh, without that dopamine hit. Yeah. So that I think, yeah, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on, you know, in particular, the, the, inward nature of when from a mental health point of view like i said i can notice a significant increase and in linkedin is like another one for me i got rid of instagram and facebook a lot but i spend a lot of time on linkedin for work but I, the same thing has started happening to me in there where i'm like i'm seeing all these other <laughs> people successful and then i'm like okay maybe i'm not being successful enough today or i'm not being productive enough today ah, same yes. cycle starts happening <laughs> then, uh, um joel i, I just I, i'm having um a full body response. Um, I just wanted to, to 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 note that, and I wanted to talk. Um, yeah, like me too, me too. I I I, I find myself really um, resenting um, social media, and the irony is that you know me and the team are on there to promote our products, our services. Um, so people who don't know about us know about us yeah. and know our message can then take steps to like learn more to become a connected human. Um, but particularly on LinkedIn, um, there is that, you know, relentless, uh, I, I, I get tired. I get tired of the, I'm thrilled to announce that I have been made CEO of the world. Um, mm. I'm thrilled to announce this. And, and there's been a couple of times over the past years, like, you know, if you are listener, I'm just gonna like level with you. Um, like Humans Connecting World Headquarters is very similar, I imagine, to Four Minds World Headquarters. Uh, and that is a, um, a stand table um, that we bought for $90 uh, off Facebook Marketplace, um, a $30 screen um, that we got off Facebook Marketplace, a $40 stand um, that, uh, I don't know, we found somewhere. And, um, yeah, like a laptop and the will of people in a couple of different cities uh, and me 
uh, wanting to make a change in the world. That's it. That's what it is right now. Um, and I use LinkedIn frequently. You may have found this episode through LinkedIn. And if that's you, hi. And I want to just sort of say that I've posted a couple of times. It's like, these are the, like this is to the people who aren't thrilled to announce something revolutionary and groundbreaking today, who aren't lining up with banners behind them and 20 other people having had like a very fantastic day, who haven't spoken to 250,000 people at a, in an audience, um, you know, over the past week. Those who are just showing up, chipping away every single day because they believe in what they're doing. And those people who like me, and I, you know, I don't want to speak on your behalf, Joel, but I get the very distinct impression that, you know, there are many days where it feels like the progress is walking, you know, up an impossibly slippery slope wearing concrete shoes. Yeah. I don't believe in uh, your religion either, but amen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Testify, Joel. But um, yeah, yeah, honestly, like it is, it, it, you know, so. Like, I think, you know, there's that that movie montage in there, like, you know, the, the triumph over, uh, over adversity and all that kind of stuff. But this, what I, what I, my point is here is that I need to tap into daily, daily, I need to tap into my inner knowing. Mm. Because looking externally, it's never enough. It's never enough, and I know that that's when I come unstuck. It yeah. is never enough. And, you know, I'm comparing myself to, I don't know, like anyone and everyone, and it's horrible, and it's terrible for my mental health. It's terrible for, like, just my well-being, full stop, mental, emotional, physical, otherwise. So tapping into me and being me seems to be, like, a pretty good place to start and end. Yeah, I think that's one of the most important things. And, you know, these platforms that we have just been talking about them in a negative sense, they are also positive platforms. It's how we connected. So there is, obviously, have, yep. um, I think, you yeah, know, there is a time and a place. But to your point is it's like, how do I stay well while I do my work? And this is something I only figured out probably six months ago. <laughs> I wish yeah. I was smarter and figured it out earlier. It was like, I'm a creature of habit. I need a schedule. I need consistency. And as a small business owner, I've made a rule now where I don't check my emails or respond to emails after 4 p.m. on a Friday because if it can wait until then, it can wait until 9 a.m. on Monday. And I used to get really stuck in my own head and it would ruin my weekend. If I saw an email late on a Friday, it would consume me all weekend and I wouldn't sleep and I would like go out drinking or whatever it is. Whereas now I just say, stuff it. <laughs> Like the person I'm going to reply to is probably already gone home by the time I reply at 4.35. They're not even going to see it until 9 a.m. So just don't look at it. Um, so yeah, it's consistent dog walks in the morning. It's trying to be a little bit more present in those dog walks and noticing things going on around rather than just like staring at my phone or like talking to people at the dog park rather than staring on my phone. It's like, even if I don't know them, just saying hi and over enough time, that hi becomes something more. And I think that's kind of what it's all about. So I think that's probably like my last little top, dot point about, you know, how I maintain my wellness. And I think, you know, if you're listening to this, you, everyone has their different things. It might be playing piano for an hour every day and you'll recharge in different ways. I think it's just important to find something that you like doing and, and just make sure you find enough time for yourself in between going to work. I think that's, that's outstanding advice. You have to be yourself first before you can be anything to anyone else. Hmm. Whether you're a leader at work, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're starting up a well, a startup, hmm. it's like you need to be yourself first before you can be. And honestly, like anything that the world gets after that is gravy. Yeah. And um, what I'm learning here. Uh, in in 2024 is that this work is amazing it it lights me up it's the thing that I feel the world absolutely needs but if I'm not me then this doesn't happen yeah 
So the critical dependency in all of that, like doing a risk analysis is like not being me. That's the biggest risk to this working or not. And so what do I need to do to be me? Yeah. Yeah, it's that self-realization of like who you really are. Like I'm very aware of all my flaws now. And my response to that is instead of convincing other people to like my flaws, it's like, if you don't like my flaws, then I'm going to spend time with people who are okay with my flaws. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Because your flaws are other people's strengths um, uh, as, uh, as that. Like, I'm really curious. Thank you for answering that, that last question without me asking it. Um, one final question, and we ask this of every guest. To someone experiencing, what's your advice to someone experiencing loneliness right now? Um, I think based off the dog park uh, kind of thing that I gave you before that analogy, having been through this myself is don't give up, you know, like try and find something you like doing and persist at it. Like good things take time. Um, you know, when I first moved to Sydney, I'd go to try a new gym or like a new place and I would try and try and try and I just, no one would respond and reciprocate back to me. And it was like, getting to the point where I was like, is there something wrong with me over like three to six months? And just like, they'd never invite me for that like next step or whatever it was. Then you just keep persisting and trying and trying a different thing, like going to a different gym or going to a different dog park. And then eventually it happens. And I mm. think the advice would just be that, you're not everyone's cup of tea. Not everyone's going to be your cup of tea. Like just don't rush into something with, you know, someone or, you know, or whatever the relationship is, friendship, whatever, if it's not quite right, you're better off taking a bit more time and finding someone who's going to accept you for who you really are and actually making that connection, which like the, the analogy about the fingers on the hands is going to become one of those fingers on your hands that you actually cherish and speak to for, you know, the rest of your life. Um, and obviously saying be patient is a bit of a cop out, but, you know, it might not help in this moment, but as someone who's been there and Phil, I know you've been, you know, there too, is like, it will happen. You just have to put yourself out there and try different things, but try things you like to do because that's where people that you'll like to hang out with will be too. Yeah. 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 I think that's outstanding advice. Those two words, persist and invest. Like persist uh, and, you know, invest in the time and effort that it will take. Yeah. Yeah. Joel, this has just been an absolute delight. I am thrilled that we brought this in under four hours uh, as, as, as the intention was stated at the beginning. I have a feeling that we'll be hearing a lot more from you uh, and the team at Full Mind um, uh, in your quest to bring real conversations about wellness to workplaces. Thank you so much for what you're doing. And moreover, thank you so much for the courage that you have in being you as you do stuff in the world. And thank you Sorry. very much. The same, same to you. Thank you for doing what you're doing and for being a platform for other people to share their stories as well. It's very powerful. I appreciate the offer to come on. Oh, it was amazing, wasn't it? Remember all the ways that you can connect with Joel and the team at Four Mind are in the episode description. We didn't quite get to it in our conversation, but I want to let you know that all that all his details are in the episode description. In wrapping up our chat and before I send you on your way to be awesome for the rest of your day, I want to highlight a couple of themes, topics, issues that Joel and I talked about, but Joel raised. And the first is something that you heard just a few moments ago in response to the question, what piece of advice can you give to someone experiencing loneliness right now? And I said those two words in summary um, just a few moments ago, but I want to come back to them right now, just in case you've forgotten. And those two words are persist and invest. When we go to do connection, and I hear this all the time, and I experience it all the time, when we go we're, and, and bravely and courageously take a step 
to do connection, to meet some other people, whether it's at the gym or a dog park or the coffee shop or workplace, whatever. It can be really discouraging when we bravely and boldly and courageously go up to someone and say, hi, um, like I've seen you around. It's awkward. It's weird, isn't it? It's, it's really hard. And quite often, it feels quite often that our connection attempts, our bids to connect are ignored or not reciprocated or um, uh, sort of potentially rudely dismissed. And that could be really discouraging. But those two words, persist and invest, are really powerful. Even though it can be discouraging, even though it's like weird and awkward and all that kind of stuff, we do need to persist. You need to persist, just like I need to persist when putting myself out there into new situations and meeting people. And also, I need to invest and you need to invest the time and um, prioritize the um, like the doing of connection. And so those two words beautifully, I feel, encapsulate what Joel was saying. And I think it's something that you can kind of put in your pocket as a takeaway from this episode um, and credit Joel for uh, when you, you bring it out uh, when you're next experiencing loneliness, or not even when you're experiencing loneliness the next time, when you want to connect, um, just as you know the, the the lovely, awesome human that you are, persist and invest. I also wanted to highlight another one of uh, Joel's points from earlier in our chat, and there is absolute transformative power in seeing a need from our own experiences and then experimenting with solutions. So Joel spoke about how it's Four Minds approach to um, experiment with uh, a response based on a need that EAP services um, aren't meeting needs. And so they're experimenting with ways that help humans connect with mental health services in workplaces. And this, um, this seeing the need and then experimenting with a response is, is a model that we adopt here too at Humans Connecting. It's a really powerful approach that you can use in your own life, you know, also at work, but specifically within yourself. When you realize that you need to work on the connection that you need and deserve. Because your loneliness is telling you that it is time for you to get that connection that you need and deserve. And you get to experiment with how you go about getting that connection. The trick here is it's the, the experimenting um, can be more targeted when you know how to listen to your loneliness because your loneliness is doing its job and your loneliness's job, remember, always remember this, it's telling you that you're not getting the connection that you need and deserve. And so the key to getting the connection that you need and deserve is within the loneliness that you're experiencing in that moment. But you get to experiment. And that experimenting, to underline that point, is more targeted when you know how to listen to your loneliness. Joel also mentioned the beautiful point um, when it comes to workplaces and the people within them, um, that humans in workplaces aren't stupid. And we know when there's a gap between what is said in workplaces and how things are done in those same workplaces. And where the gap exists and where the gap between what is said and what is done persists, that's that word again, we humans stop paying attention to what's said and begin to only pay attention to what's done. 
And there's a real risk in workplace environments that where that gap features, workplace wellness initiatives, conversations, the, the events that, that highlight um, workplace uh, like mental health and, and, and psychological safety in workplaces, they fall flat because they're seen as empty words and, and we run the risk of those initiatives kind of being perceived as going through the motions. And leaders and HR professionals listening, please take note of that. I suspect that you already know this, but sometimes it does take real conversations delivered with kindness and honesty from outside the system to kickstart processes that really begin to close that gap between um, what is said and what is done. And then finally, there was a point that Joel said there about the loneliness of leadership and the leadership uh, loneliness, the loneliness of leadership is real isn't it? Many of you in the audience at Humans Connecting hold positions of leadership in your workplaces. And like you probably don't need a reminder beyond loneliness of leadership is real. It was part of my loneliness experience as well. There is a real loneliness to being a leader. So please know that our Creating Connected Workplaces service at Humans Connecting contains a component that specifically addresses the loneliness experienced by leaders. And that component is amongst the other components of our Creating Connected Workplace service um, that start and lead kind and honest conversations promoting social connection and social well-being in workplaces. And if you're interested in finding out more about that, uh, the Creating Connected Workplaces option in the services menu on our website has all the details. Okay, there was a bit there to wrap up, wasn't there? <laughs> but thank you for joining me and the Humans Connecting team for this episode. And we'd love to hear, as always, we'd love to hear what you thought about it. So please feel free to comment on YouTube or send us an email um, or leave a comment on the social channels. You know, anyway is a good way. And all the details about how you can do that are in the um, episode description. Be sure to check out our website, humansconnecting.org, for details about how we help you, your workplace, and communities thrive through loneliness and get the connection that we all need and deserve. Finally, quick reminder, we are absolutely here to make a positive social impact. So if you're a business and are looking for ways to support humans to feel more connected and want to have a positive social impact too, check the link in the episode description to partner with us. And that partnership could look like advertising on a future episode of the podcast or collaborating with us in other ways. Check out the partner with us uh, menu on our website um, or uh, just click the link in the episode description. Thank you again for joining us for this episode today and for spending some of your day with us. We really appreciate it. We simply can't wait to see you in the next episode. But until then, mind the gap, follow your curiosity, and you'll be well on the way to becoming an awesomely connected human. We're totally here for it. We'll see you later.